Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Aaron Smith and I'm the CEO of the Energy Environmental Building Alliance, as well as the board treasurer for Team Zero. Yeah, not a house that one could like get a mortgage on. So um, because the, the condition was too far, too far gone. So we were those uh, perhaps foolhardy people who decided, oh yeah, we still want this house. And actually, um, didn't, you call, it, didn't you call the house the fiscal cliff? <laughs> the last house we That's called the fiscal house. cliff. Yeah, we don't have a name for this one. We don't. Have, yeah. So this one, uh, that one was on an even steeper part of the, the same hill, that this was more on the top of the hill. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, this was, this was a house that was, you know, occupied by raccoons and all that good stuff. Wow. Well, I mean, it's incredible to see today. And that is not a background image. That is actually the uh, family room or, or living room of the home. Yes. Uh, so as you purchased that property, how did you think of, you know, how did you set your goals for what you wanted to achieve? Because your last home was actually really energy efficient as well. Can you talk about, you know, maybe the lessons learned there and then how you approach this uh, new home purchase and, and looking at remodeling it? Sure. So the last home needed a lot of repairs, but it was in much better condition, which is a plus and a minus when it comes to a renovation. It was livable, you're not tempted to tear everything out, but in this case, it wasn't. And so that made the decision to, you know, do a full gut rehab a lot easier because, you know, there really wasn't a whole lot to keep. We kept the foundation, the structure, um, the stairs, the floors. Some of the interior doors. Some of the interior doors. Um, otherwise, the rest of it could be kept. But I think one of the main things we wanted to do differently this time around was in the last house, it was an oil fire boiler. When we moved in, we tore that out first thing and put in natural gas, but kept the radiators um, and the hydronic heat and added some radiant floors in a couple of locations. This time, we also had put in, for example, a fireplace insert and the chimney liner. And this time we had sort of changed our thinking about um, having on-site combustion. And so going in, the main thing we knew we wanted to do was electrify and yeah. off of, eliminate all of the, all of the on-site combustion completely. So I, I think that that's a really powerful statement that you just said, and that many people listening to this are thinking about how do I electrify or how do I decarbonize my home? Um, and that's, it's tougher to do. I mean, you're in Connecticut, it's you know, pretty cold winters. 
so we're excited to hear about your story on uh, your goal toward decarbonization. What other goals did you have for the home uh, beyond decarbonization? I think indoor air quality. Definitely. And we have done, you know, a fairly good job of that, I think, on the last home. But some of the things were just non-issues because we, we gutted basically from the exterior in that house and went down to the sheathing and insulated and did a, um, a cold pour of foam in the walls without removing the interior plaster and trim and so on. Here, since we were adding so much more material, there were a lot more choices to make and things to think about in terms of trying to get better air quality. Also in the, um, in the last house, originally we thought we could get away with an exhaust only strategy and we ended up adding an ERV okay. a few years into it um, because we found that it was, it was fairly tight. It wasn't crazy tight. It was two and a half ACH 50, I think. And um, we just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't doing it for us. And we were much more comfortable after we had the, the ERV in. So this house we knew from the start we wanted the ERV. We also, in the last house, had added um, a uh, fresh air damper to operate when the kitchen hood was running. Makeup air. A makeup air damper. Um, and that was a, a late add, actually, in order to get our lead certification, um, because we were just getting too negative. We were going down, even with not very much exhaust flow from the kitchen range hood. With only 175 CFM, we were gotten down to minus 11 pascals. So we added that damper. So we knew in this house right away that we wanted to address that and make sure that we were going to be able to have balanced ventilation. Sure. Although we use the range hood less simply because in the old house we had gas. So we ran it even when we were baking. Now we only use it when we're cooking on the range. We've got an induction oh. um, cooktop and a um, an electric range and so we we only are running the exhaust when we're frying or something not when we're baking makes sense on other goals for your house i know you're looking at zero energy ready home and lead for platinum and then one of the pilot credits and lead can you talk about that so there's a pilot credit for getting to zero and so we have um have been tracking that in this house we decided we wanted to put on as much solar as was practical, I guess. And and one of the best suggestions we got from our solar provider was, you know, we were standing around looking at the house in its original state and he was like, what would you think about getting rid of that dormer on the front? Mm. And we did and it was the front of your house is south, right? The front of our house faces yeah. south. So it's it was a lovely expansive roof, but I think it just looks a lot better to have it be a solid rectangle of solar it's a very colonial looking home um and so you know working around that dormer would have been a little bit trickier so um we have 8.64 kw mm -hmm. system um we also uh wound up putting in two tesla powerwall batteries so that's 27 kw of storage and um we've been kind of, you know, tracking our tracking our usage since we moved in in July. So for July through the end of February, we are um, about 14% more. We've produced about 14% more than we've used. So we're net positive through, I hope, the worst of the winter. <laughs> so oh, that's we'll where we end up. And that wasn't necessarily in the very early stages of this project. We didn't know if that was possible. We were just kind of aiming for as good as we could within our budget. You know, that was obviously a, a constraint, so. Can you talk about just solar and battery? Because, you know, I've got 14.4 on my house as well. We talked about this before, but to me, it's kind of, we've reached the point where it's a no brainer for folks financially and, and, and otherwise. And, and then maybe coupling that with battery storage. I know I lived in Connecticut for nine and a half years and we had two hurricanes come over the top and we're out of power for extended period of time. So it's definitely a, there's a resiliency factor as well in, in Connecticut, but can you kind of just say, I mean, obviously you wanted to decarbonize, but why solar and batteries make so much sense? What maybe you see as the financial opportunity for people to do that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll start with the batteries because the batteries are sort of, 
people are like, oh, you know, how much energy are your batteries saving you? And they're, they're not really, um, as far as just consuming energy. It, you're still consuming it. It's just that you're shifting um, the source and you're shifting the timing. So by being able to harvest energy on site, so the batteries don't charge up except from the solar panels. Okay. Um, so to be able to harvest that energy on site, um, that is hopefully reducing the energy that we have to bring from offsite. When you bring energy from offsite, you have um, losses in distribution, um, a lot of losses, um, and then you also are subject to the uh, you know how your energy is produced wherever you live. So every place has a different um, no, portfolio. What's the right word for it? It's the the yeah. mixture of, of energy sources, whether it's wind or solar or gas or oil or coal, right? So um, I think that was um, the nice thing about the batteries is is that saving of the distribution losses and also the resiliency for when you know the grid goes down. We had it's been down a couple times, just one time for a day uh, this summer when we had a big storm. And yeah, being the only house in your neighborhood that has the lights on, the AC on, the fridge on. Um, nobody else does um, is, is kind of nice. And, um, you know, we had a pretty cold snap here recently um, where it got really windy and I, you know, worried, uh, you know, what do we do? We don't have anything else. All we have is electricity. So, and we don't have a generator that we can plug in. So um, it was, you know, peace of mind as well. Yeah. And we knew we would need some type of backup. We have all above ground power lines here and a lot of old trees, which, as we all know, is a recipe for a lot of outages. Our, we have a, um, a municipal power and water company, very small, like specific to our neighborhood. Um, and they actually do a great job of getting things back up and running. So we, our, our outages tend to be pretty small. But this one this summer that was more than 24 hours, which, by the way, was at a time when elsewhere in Connecticut, people were out for a week, more than a week, you yeah. know. Um, but okay. it was it was great, and we had neighbors coming over to use the internet, and and we got a whole bunch of stuff um, from freezers. people's freezers. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually ended up buying a small chest freezer because <laughs> we realized this might be a thing. Like people start showing up with you know scallops, and you're like, oh, okay. wonderful. <laughs> we feel a little guilty, so. Uh, yeah, that was a, we haven't, we haven't plugged that in yet, but that's something we're preparing for for the next time around. But I would say that the, the batteries were the part that's a little bit more challenging from the financial perspective. So we did look at that as an investment. But if you compare it to a generator that we would have wanted, if, we, if we'd if gotten a truly, you know, integrated switch ready um, backup solution, that would have been an investment as well. So it, it wasn't that much of a premium. I think you bring up a, you bring up a great point, which is in, in my view, we're, we're getting close to parity between a whole home generator that runs off natural gas or propane and adding batteries um, to offer resilience. Can you talk about that uh, a little bit? No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think the, um, we would have wanted something regardless. You know, in, in our last house, we had a fireplace and we had a 1950s gas range. I was in that, I was a, a chambers range person, which is like a whole cult unto itself. That was, that was the hardest thing about <laughs> getting up fossil fuels. The fireplace I'm okay without, um, but oh, I did love my chambers. <laughs> but so you could have, you could cook hot meals and you could make hot water awesome. and you could have the fireplace going in the event that everything else was down. Right. So you had some sense of security maybe from that. Um, I don't know that we actually had very extended periods where we had to, to deal with that. Yeah. But so moving to electrification, you do consider, you know, what is this going to be? What is this going to be like? But I think you're absolutely right with the change in costs with the available incentives and taking advantage of tax credits and all the rest of it, it becomes um, not that much different than another type of solution. We also ran a little experiment um, inadvertently recently where on a night where we got down to about 17 degrees outside, we did not have any of our heating on because the two-year-old 
turns off the upstairs system. I turned one off because I was doing something. And then one of them, uh, oh, I, some ice had gotten Some ice had dripped on it. I wasn't managing the outdoor unit. And yeah, so I yeah. shut it off. It's like, oh, I'll get that tomorrow when I've got sunshine. Yeah, but you know, we sleep upstairs. So we assumed that system would be on overnight. However, um, somebody is now tall enough to uh, reach the thermostat. So that was off. And it was 64 instead of 68 in the morning or something like. So all the, the solar in, in the house, I mean, it all goes in hand in hand in the batteries with regard to resilience, right? So, you know, the house consumes less, it, it needs less energy, and it also loses less energy, you know, when you don't have power. So it all kind of works together. Yeah. One important point I want to um, capture for the audience is that if you have solar versus having solar and batteries, you're then allowed to use that power when there's a grid outage. So can you talk about, and I think people forget that, that, oh, I have solar and the grid goes down. I should be able to use solar. No, you can't. Can you just explain that to the audience? It's completely seamless with the system that we have. There's, um, you don't just buy the batteries. You buy a brain, Tesla, mm -hmm. it's called a gateway that comes with it that is watching everything that's going on, including the weather. <laughs> so that they go into, um, you can activate something called storm watch mode, which basically means that the batteries will stay at 100% um, in preparation when bad weather is expected. So that's all kind of part of the, the control system. But I think that control is able to um, anticipate things and react so quickly that in, in our situation, um, when we had a, a tropical storm this summer, the moment that it went down, I only knew because I got a text notification on my phone. I mean, nothing even so nice flicker flicker. Or anything like, like it that. was, I was at my computer, which is a desktop, you know, plugged in with plugged in monitors, no battery. I mean, so, and, and it was completely right. instantaneous seamless. and seamless. So that was, um, that was pretty cool. I mean, yeah. so, so that's a, a piece of it that I think is for, for where we live, it's, um, it's, it makes a lot of sense. And on the flip side, we don't have any time of use pricing advantages that battery storage could yield in other, in other markets. In fact, the ability to even do grid tied solar is fairly new. When we did our first house, that was not an option. If you put solar on your roof, you would not have been able to connect it to the grid. They just were not set up for it. I mean, we only got online billing like fairly recently. So this is there are there are pluses and minuses to the to the small power company, right? So um, like I said, they do an awesome job of fixing things when power goes down. So on the whole, we'll take it. But they they were not set up for um, supporting solar a few years ago and, and we're quite a ways away, I think, from like time of use pricing and stuff like that. So that's not a reason to use batteries where we are, but the fact that we do have, like I said, above ground power lines and a lot of trees and fairly common outages, it certainly does bring some peace of mind for sure. And I will say that um, we're using them quite a bit. I mean, they definitely deplete during the night to keep the heat on, to keep the lights on. And on the whole, it, it, it definitely contributes to the amount that we're able to capture from our solar without, or with very minimal um, distribution losses or transmission losses. Even if we were sending it back, sending the solar back to the grid, which of course we do other times when the batteries are full, um, there's some, there's going to be some amount of transmission loss there. And I think when we're able to capture it in the batteries and then reuse it, you know, starting at 5 PM when the, when the sun goes down, when we're making dinner and, you know, taking our baths and doing all that stuff. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a nice story, I guess. And I, I definitely think it has helped to contribute to keeping our, our carbon lower, our operating carbon. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, you talked about, I think there was an important point you talked about with your heat pumps were shut off in the whole house and you got up and it was only at, at 17 degrees Fahrenheit, you were still at 60 something the next morning. And to me, that speaks about the importance of building your envelope correctly, 
uh, air tightness. Can you talk about the approach that you guys did around everything with the envelope, the air tightness, the insulation, all of that a little bit? Sure. Uh, so we obviously were dealing with an existing structure. So that limits you to a certain degree. Um, the walls are only, you know, two by fours and the roof was only two by, actually two by fives, which is kind of weird. But anyway, um, and then we also needed to keep the aesthetics uh, in mind as we're deciding, you know, what we were doing. So, so we basically came up with an approach um, that was cavity insulation in the exterior walls uh, with a layer of continuous insulation on the outside. You, um, did, a, you did a rock wall. <clears throat> Or your we did mineral wool, yep. R15, yep, in um, the existing studs. Um, and then um, when we gutted or when we um, cleared the outside of the house uh, down to the sheathing, and that's when we put up actually uh, one inch of polyisocyanurate. So it's about our six and a half per and inch. You did, and you did a one inch so you could keep your over. Right. Not so it's like we, we wanted to put, we always <laughs> suggest to our clients to put as much insulation as you can on the outside. The continuous insulation is worth a lot more than cavity insulation inside the envelope. But yeah, to make it look right, we, we couldn't really justify more than an inch. And we have a, a, a cement board um, cladding with a rain screen, you know, detail. So there's another three quarters of an inch on top of that. Um, so yeah, that's the walls. And we also try to, um kind of, you know, keep a, a balance of maybe about 50% as much continuous on the outside as you have in the cavity, just to kind of control any potential for, for condensation and things. So I had, that is if you had R15 in the walls, you're trying to get it at seven and a half on the continuous, right? Ish, yeah, and, and it wasn't, you know, perfect, but, but that type of proportion. And so, had we added more outside, we would have needed to fur out the framing inside, which we could have done. And, and we talked about whether that was worth it. And I think it. Um, at the end of the day, we'd also had the experience of living in our last house, which also had two by four walls. Um, and we just, we were pretty thermally comfortable there. And so we, um, yeah, we, we decided to stick with kind of, and, and, and to stay within our budget, quite honestly. So as much as if I were building new, I wouldn't have built a house with two by four walls, but the sort of efforts to go to, to add on to all that would have been possible. Yes. Um, it seemed like we were maybe getting into maybe a little bit of diminishing returns there. Yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. Well, as I'm, I'm a HERS rater, so, um, you know, I could run the energy model half a dozen different ways and um, look at the performance of each option that we're considering. And, uh, yeah, and, and that's just, you know, that's just exterior walls. So when you get to the top of the envelope, um, you know, I wanted rigid, rigid insulation on top of the sheathing. Um, our contractor wasn't comfortable with that. And so we had to keep everything um, underneath the sheathing. We talked about doing layers of mineral wool. Um, we were also, uh, another goal of ours was, uh, not maybe a goal, but a consideration was uh, greenhouse gas um, potential in, in materials, global warming potential. You were looking at the carbon footprint of the materials you were choosing as well, which I think is really uh, insightful. Right, yeah, so, and that, so that's a whole nother conversation that's actually just, I think, starting to, um, get louder in the community. It's always been there. Um, yeah. People are really waking up to the fact that, oh, well, concrete has a ton of embodied energy. Yeah. Um, or like cement board siding. I mean, we really went back and forth. We wanted to do cedar uh, because the embodied energy and, and, and greenhouse gases, and, and but we just couldn't justify it with regard to maintenance and durability and cost and aesthetics, to be honest. And some of it too, I, I found with a single family custom project, you don't necessarily have access to some of the same choices that I'm actually used to on working as a consultant on bigger projects. Okay. And so that was, um, you know, we had explored, for example, triple pane windows, and we could hardly get any of the passive house window installers. They were so overwhelmed with orders that yeah. dealing with a, a custom single family home just wasn't in the cards for some of them. Right. Um, and, and of course, then there's a, a cost that comes along with that. And then another thing that I hadn't necessarily fully appreciated was 
Steve mentioned what our, what our contractor was comfortable with. We knew who we wanted to use for the all of the exterior stuff, the same guy we used in our last project. He does great work and fits within our, our budget. And there's some materials that he just isn't going to want to right. work with. And so that becomes a consideration. I, I was sort of interested in a different siding product that's used a lot in the Midwest, but it's just not used out here that has more wood fiber in it. And therefore I thought, you know, some less carbon. Less, less carbon. Um, but I called around to a bunch of lumber yards. None of them carried it. They said, well, we can get it. And you try to find... Uh, convince my contractor who's squeezing us in basically as a favor to experiment with a whole new product. And it was like, no, not going to happen. So I, to be honest, we had sort of the same experience with our, with our heat pumps, which have, have worked out great. But at the time that we were designing and planning this, there was exactly one manufacturer of a mid static system in the size that we needed. So talk about selection, right? <laughs> it kind of narrows it down. Um, but, but one thing we tried that was new here that we looked at as a way to maybe lower our carbon a little bit was um, we wanted to get it tighter this time around than we did yeah. at, the, at the last house. And right. the last house you said you were at what for ACH? <laughs> two and a half. I think it was about two and a half, half. or 2.6 ACH yeah. 50. So better than code considerably, but. Good, not great, is yeah, good, not great. How, I would, how I would describe it. And so um, here, when we had the exterior basically done, but the inside was gutted, so just so close just, cuts. Just to recap for everyone, you've got, you know, you do your mineral wool insulation, you've got continuous insulation on the outside, you've got a weather resistive barrier on top of that, you've got your great siding, you put double pane windows in, I think, right? We did. The double pane. Now, to get it really airtight, what do you do? So we were debating between, I, I was actually trying to find somebody to do um, dense packed cellulose in the walls because I thought, you know, this would be great from a, uh, for some air sealing benefit, fantastic carbon profile for that material. Couldn't find anybody to do it. <laughs> so I had a couple of people come out, say they were going to give me quotes, didn't follow. <laughs> so again, it was a supply and, and demand issue sort of that we, we ran into there. Um, and then we um, decided to try Aero Barrier, which yeah. was something we've seen, we've, we've done on multifamily projects, yeah. but this was sort of a new thing on single family. And you, they often won't do single family, but it's a, um, a fan propelled waterborne glue essentially that by pressurizing a apartment or a home um, gets forced into the sort of small very tiny cracks and things and it dries they use blower doors to, to blow this stuff so there's no propellant and so it basically seals holes as it's the air is sort of moving through the, the small cracks and what we um so that that was really cool and we actually had a little event and we had um it was on march 5th it was just before the pandemic and i remember we had big bottles of hand sanitizer and it, it kind of terrifies me to think about it now but, um, how close we were but um uh it was it was really neat and so at that point so the windows are in the um, exterior is done, but we're just gutted on the inside. Before and after on the aero barrier? We did. So that at that point, we were about five air changers per hour at 50 pascals. And so, um, and that was the point at which we were like, oh, we wished it was tighter. And, and really where we had issues was those junctures with existing conditions, the rubble stone foundation, the chimney, you know, stuff like that was were places that we were, and it was just tough to address. We had we had fully lined the basement with taped poly. We had spray foamed the crawl space, hmm. but we were still, you know, it just it just happens in some of those spaces. So um, they uh, they they normally won't do this approach in in single family homes because you have to be able to get it. It has to be tight enough to begin with that you actually can pressurize, right? In order to spray this, they set up these misting nozzles and it basically sprays this, um, this water-based glue essentially um, into the air. And so the fact that we knew we were already at five ACH 50 was that 
why they did it because they knew that they would be able to go on from there. So for us, this was kind of an alternative to like maybe spray foam then as our other option, which is what everybody wanted to sell us. That was highly available mm -hmm. in our market and, and, and was a product that we used on our roofs and in our crawl space because it was the best material for the job given that we had some space limitations and, and other things. Um, so, you know, this was, uh, the arrow barrier got it down to about 1.6. Okay. I think. When I did my blower door, it ended up being 1.75 <clears throat> or something like that. Yeah. That's incredible. So, you know, I think uh, I think below two was something we were very happy with for an existing home. Um, so it, it worked out. It worked out really well. So I think it's a sort of a niche strategy that isn't for every home, but but definitely has uh, benefit as, for us. As we talked about this, um, we both said we would. Uh, I would. I would have used Aeroberry in my own home, but I had already moved in. Yes. Definitely put that on your skin. Don't move in before you do it. Do it. <laughs> and it does leave a, you know, a little film and it's a, it's a water, you know, washable, but how much washing do you want to do? We still have some on our windows because I didn't do <laughs> clean it up like I should have the first time around. Um, you know, you bring up a really interesting point, obviously, Steve, you're an energy raider, but talk about the how critical it is for people that want to build a zero energy home to engage with somebody or do it themselves, but to do an, a blower door test, to maybe have an energy rater come alongside them to help them with quality assistance, quality control. Do you want to just talk about maybe both of you talk through that process a little bit? It was definitely something that we recommend. Yeah, well, I mean, my job is to be um, as a verge raider, green raider, consultant, et cetera, is to be another set of eyes basically for both the design team and the construction team. And doing our own projects usually works out in my favor. When I'm in the field, I'm kind of beating somebody up over something they did wrong. And I got to say, look, I look at the, the stuff that I did in my own house a week after I did it and look at it like, what was I thinking? That's terrible. And so um, having just another set of eyes um, that can look at your project um, from a different perspective and hopefully an educated perspective um, yeah. is really priceless in, in picking up those things that are gonna they're going to fall through the cracks. And yeah. so that's just and the important thing as our audience looks for is look for a certified, a currently certified energy rating firm, right? Right. Yeah. And, you know, this industry, I'm sure all industries change and evolve. Ours, I think, is evolving very quickly, um, especially lately with, you know, decarbonization, electrification, you know, climate change, et cetera. So, yeah, you really want to engage somebody who can, uh, they, they don't have to do the full package from front to beginning. You can have a consultant drop in at any point and, and bounce ideas off of them. Um, if you wanted to, but yeah, we recommend having someone from the design stage through final testing yeah. to actually ensure that what you aimed for in the beginning was actually achieved. And the cost as a percentage of project is very reasonable to have that extra set of QA, QC, is it not? Well, we think so, but that's what we get paid to do, so we're probably biased. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we, if I'm not an energy rater, but I would tell you that we we hear very reasonable prices to bring an expert alongside you. We would encourage anybody remodeling or building new to bring on a, a certified energy rater. You know, I, I compare it for people to like go into the gym. Like we all can go to the gym, but if you have a personal trainer, like you probably go more and you get more out of it, right? You get better results, Essentially. right? Essentially. And, and I will say that when you're, we're working on our own project, just like our clients, we are much more distracted by how things look, by how much things cost, by how soon things can get here. We're driven by factors other than the, you know, just the sort of energy and green. And like Steve said, having somebody that that's sort of all that they care about to kind of keep you true to your original goals. Because I think that's where we start to deviate, even in our own project, right? If, we, if we're not held to those goals by sort of measurable metrics and or somebody watching over our shoulder, 
which by the way, will be our colleagues as well. <laughs> we definitely have a lot of support from our colleagues on this project, 100%. Um, but those, those are really necessary because it's, it's a, it's a stressful process. Design and construction is a stressful process. Oh, you sure. have to make a lot of modifications along the way, just based on how things are available, how much things cost, things you weren't expecting. Not to mention there's all the stuff that you find in a renovation, you know, that like Surprise. after you yeah. demo something, we're like, oh, you know, we, we found that we were four inches short on height on the back porch because the joists, which we assumed measuring them underneath, sat on top of the foundation were actually notched. And so suddenly you're like, oh, <laughs> that's a surprise. But so you're distracted by those things from the designer perspective, from the owner perspective, from even the contractor perspective. And having a third party energy rater to keep you on track is, is pretty critical because even we have been in a position where it's very tempting to say, Oh, just do this and get it done. Right. So that, that's human. I mean, that's, you know, you're, you're trying to get things done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great advice. So we talked about the solar and the batteries and we talked about the exterior envelope of the house and getting that really airtight. And, and by the way, I mean, 1.7 ACH is really, really good. I mean, what, what's the path, if you wanted to get to passive house, which is incredible, you'd be at what below 0.7. No, it's 0.6. Right. 0.6, yeah, 0.6 or 0.7. So you're you're halfway to passive house in a way, right? Or maybe a third of the way. But anyway, it's really good number for a uh, renovation of a home, especially a hundred year old home. But now I want to get to. So here we're sitting here. We know, okay, I've got to plan my mechanicals for my home. I've got you've got this goal of decarbonization of being zero energy, but maybe some of those things that you talked about, Marine come to the fore, right? Like, you know, you want to do heat pumps, but you only had one selection. I'm interested in actually the mechanical engineering manual J type side of it. So now, you know, you have a reduced, you've done the energy modeling, you have a reduced load. How, walk people through that. Cause I think that's a place where a lot of people get caught up is on the HVAC IAQ section having it apply to decarbonization and a, a really energy efficient home. Can you talk us through that process? So it was, it was funny. We knew we wanted to do heat pumps, but we actually didn't know what kind we wanted to do. I was adamant that I thought we should get rid of ducts. And maybe some of that perspective came from living without ducts in our last house, having hydronic heat, and we didn't have cooling. Um, and so, you know, we looked to a lot of ductless options. We were sort of weighing the pros and cons. And ultimately, we made what my colleague Bill Zora would call a, um, a multi-attribute analysis, which was a, an Excel spreadsheet, that we basically listed the options about ductless heads, ducted, et cetera. And then we put in kind of whether things were high, medium, low, like a, a ranking, one, two, or three, for things like comfort, how green we thought it would be, whether we thought one was more efficient than another, um, how it would look, whether we thought it was something other people would like when we came to resell this house, right? So we kind of put everything on the table, cost certainly yeah, was on there cost. as well, availability. <clears throat> so we had everything on there, including, like I said, stuff that as a sustainability consultant, I don't worry as much about how things look or the resale value, right? That's not where I need to always be focused. And so when those things were all on the table, it was very interesting to me. And so we, you know, ranked things as like one, two or three, and then added up the points. We did this for our window choices too. Yeah. It became very clear what the answer was. And for us, it was a ducted system, which like I said, was absolutely not where my head was yeah. to begin with. But when you actually lay out what you're trying to accomplish, um, that was that was what won out. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, we looped in our colleague, um, Rob Aldrich, who's a mechanical engineer, and uh, had him help us with the design. And one of the interesting things about electrification is that you're looking at the whole package, which is heating, cooling, ventilation, and hot water. And mm -hmm. hot water is sort of a sticky thing a little bit. And for us, um, when Rob was doing his, his load calcs, 
he became pretty solidly convinced that, you know, putting a regular heat pump water heater in the basement was going to make the house too cold and put us into different sizing categories. And so we ran through the exercise of, well, then do we add another heat pump in the basement to make it warmer for the water heater, you know, the heat pump water heater, and you kind of go round and round, or do we just do an electric resistance tank and put some extra insulation on it, you know, get the, like we went back and forth. And um, ultimately this was, you know, one of the places where we decided to kind of go over budget. <laughs> and we put in a, um, a sand and Sanco heat pump water heater, which is one of the ones that has the external condenser outside. So it's right. just the tank inside. And also the refrigerant in it is carbon dioxide. So it's, um, yeah, it's you know, CO2 refrigerant, which doesn't have global warming potential of some of these others. Yeah, yeah. really great option. And it's been it's been really great. I mean, you have to you have to make sure you get heat trace on the plumbing because you essentially have you know yeah. things running from inside. The audience, a, a heat trace is an electrical wire that'll keep it warm from the outside to the inside, right? Yeah. So there were some considerations like that, and I'll also say that we had no problems with the installation, but most definitely our electrician had never worked on one, our plumber had never worked on one our um, HVAC installer who did the, the condenser had never worked on one. So it was it was a new thing, but it's been- Was it, sort of was it close enough to installing a heat pump? Uh, no? Okay. All of the heat pump you know, um, operation is in the outdoor unit. So right. it's all self-contained. It's a, and so basically all you have is um, the hot water supply and return loop between the outdoor unit and the tank, which is inside the house. Um, you have some very basic controls. Um, you know, the wiring is pretty basic. The plumbing is uh, pretty basic. I think the, the biggest thing to keep in mind if people are considering this type of technology is um, your location and, and where, where you're going to put it. Because we had a spot where we knew we knew what we were going to do as we were designing this, and so I was able to locate the tank directly out or inside the foundation from where I knew the outdoor unit would be. Yeah. So my my water loop is very short yeah. and only a you know three feet of it is exposed outside the house and it's highly insulated. Did you try to position that outdoor unit more on the southeast or southwest corners of the house or didn't no. didn't look at it? No, it was I, it was just a prioritization of keeping the outdoor unit close to the indoor unit. A short loop. Right. <laughs> Great. Uh, I love what you said about, you know, you had a mechanical engineer, I assume, to help you with the energy loads and the manual J. And when you're going to a decarbonized house, can you just talk about the importance of that step for a homeowner that somebody that understands decarbonization and heat pumps and, and water heater heat pumps is brought to bear on the situation? Well, I would argue it's pretty darn important in any house. It's I mean, you know, I had a three ton and and it goes out and the guy who comes to give me a quote says, well, I'm going to put four ton in you because you're talking, or I'm going to put four ton in new because you're talking about doing the addition. And we want to make sure you got plenty of capacity and all this stuff. So you just, you take that conversation and then you, you distill it down to a house that has this level of consumption and becomes just that much more important. So when you talk about sizing equipment and sizing it poorly, um, everything is amplified as far as the effects. So dehumidification um, and um, meeting the, the minimum load and the maximum load in a cold climate um, and not oversizing, not undersizing, your tolerances shrink, I think, quite a bit yeah. when you're in a house like this, you have less wiggle room. Well, and I think that for, for me, I was very comfortable with the concept that we should be I, I'd rather be undersized than oversized. And I know that that sounds kind of funny, but you get so many efficiency benefits and so many dehumidification benefits, which were two of my biggest concerns. I mean, we're saying these days, as we start to get our loads down, you don't need a heating and cooling system. You need dehumidification and humidification with like a little bit of supplemental heating and cooling, right? And, so we're, and, we're shifting our perspective on that. And so I had people telling me like, oh, I think this west facing, you know, porch where you have a lot of glazing is going to get overheated. And I was like, well, what are you using as your um, summertime design temperature? Because I don't need it to be 68 degrees out there. 
I think it can be 82 in my west facing porch. And I know this because I've been living in a house with a south facing sun porch. Mm. With and no it cooling in it. With no cooling in it. And it was fine. And <laughs> house was with the same windows. And, yeah. Right. And so it was sort of like, I, and and I and I will say that even our colleague Rob, we know some in some situations, different things we were analyzing. We were saying like, oh well, I don't know. I'm worried about that that back porch where we've got no heat at all, and it was it's got an exposed again, floor and an exposed roof. Right. Yeah. But it's wide it's open totally to the rest fine. of the house, and it's totally fine. And if it was really cold, I would be. I would much rather plug in a space heater. If it got down to minus 20 for three days, I'd rather plug in a space heater than be oversized the the other 362 days of the year. So I think that's what it came down to. But to be honest, I mean, we've we've been down to two degrees, zero degrees this winter, not for long periods, right? And we haven't had a It's not like Minnesota, that's for sure. But, you know, I'm... We've had zero comfort issues. And and by the way, we keep the house at 70 degrees. So like we are not suffering in any way, shape, or form. We again we've got a toddler, you know, there's no keeping a blanket on this kid. So like we don't when we lived alone, it was different. <laughs> but but now um we keep it pretty darn temperate. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, but again, I- just talking about how everything is connected. Um there are no cold spots. There are no drafty spots. Um, even in front of the windows on a cold night, you know, you don't feel um, discomfort. And so again, the efficiency um, and the comfort go hand in hand. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that's fantastic. So on your HVAC system, we had, do you just want to detail, you know, your, I think you said you had an ERV, your heat pumps, your, it sounds like you might have had a dehumidifier, which, no. But just, we don't have a dehumidifier, but, but I think the heat pumps are giving us, in the summertime, they gave us great dehumidification. So yeah, we have a, um, so again, existing home, didn't have a lot of great opportunities, and it's a pretty open floor plan here as well on the, the main level, so, um, and no closets. <laughs> so um, we had limited opportunities to run ductwork, so we decided to do separate systems for the upstairs and the downstairs. So we have a, a one-ton mid-static Fujitsu for mm-hmm. each of those. So we've got one located in the attic that's serving the upstairs bedrooms and bathroom. And then we've got one located in the basement that's serving the, the ground floor. The one in the ground floor is slightly larger because there's a, a porch oh, addition. Outside. And so that's the one that's closest to being at its capacity, I guess, but I mean, we've had zero, zero comfort problems. And then in the, um, in the basement. The Fujitsu system in your attic, that is inside of the building envelope as well, which is critical for people as they think about this, right? Yeah. So all of our ducts are in passively conditioned space. Yeah. And actually, as it is right now, there's no door on the attic steps. So um, there's plenty of (laughs) communication between the attic. It is a it is a walk up attic, but it's not really full height. So we were comfortable just kind of dedicating that to storage and mechanical yeah, space. Uh, so uh, and in the basement, we actually finished and conditioned about half of it, mm-hmm. and that's currently Steve's office. But um, it's set up with a a little kind of mini kitchenette and. Um, and a bathroom down there because we thought at some point we might want a, a mother-in-law suite, suite or, something. or something like that. So for down there, we have a separate um, ductless head. And that's actually a lot bigger than the space requires just because that was, we got the smallest one that we could and it's just the, the load's low. But um, it is a walkout basement and one portion of it does have a lot of glazing. It's basically um, got casement windows, nearly floor to ceiling on, on two sides. So there's a fair amount of... Uh, and then who, what type of ERV did you use? The Panasonic. Panasonic really only has one full house ERV, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 100 CFM maximum, I think. Nice. And that, that just serves the upstairs. So the upstairs has got the three bedrooms okay. and a couple bathrooms. Um, this is one thing we learned, which was we think is a mistake now that we're figuring it out. Now that we're always home, Maureen's office is here on the main level, my office is on the lower level. 
we don't have any you know, automatic mechanical ventilation on these levels. It's just local exhaust. Um, and so we're going to most likely add in a dedicated fresh air um, fan um, that'll not precondition, unfortunately, but pre-filter air to make up for um, our dryer, our range hood, and the bathroom exhaust fan, and then also just to provide fresh air um, for, these, for these levels. <coughs> Makes sense. Yeah, that was something that, you know, we, again, we undershot a little bit. Um, after we had added the ERV to the last house, it seemed to work great. But again, we were not home all the time. And right. so we hadn't exactly quite factored that, quite factored that in. So um, yeah, we're going to end up doing a little bit more ventilation, which of course will be a, a small amount Just of additional, additional energy. Yeah. Um, so we're still in the process of, you know, fine tuning. We've been in here seven months, eight months, but uh, yeah, we're, Still, still got to keep commissioning. You know, goes on for at least a full year. So let me tell me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to talk about kind of what I would put in fun products around the decarbonized home now, which would be we didn't talk about your washer dryer, but I would assume you have a heat pump. Uh, so what? What you did electric? Okay. So just to go ahead. Talk that was you know I looked at the energy model and saw I suggested Maureen, oh, well, we can shave off experts index points by going with a uh, heat pump condensing dryer. But it was, we didn't even have to do the spreadsheet for this, for this one. Uh, we weren't willing to deal with the implications of the heat pump closed dryer, which is essentially that they, they take longer. Um, some might argue that they don't get the clothes quite as dry. And, you know, we're doing laundry a lot, especially with the toddler. Um, so, yes, I mean, we're, and I, I, look at the heat being pumped out of the house is every time the clothes dryer is going, I'm like, oh, I wish we could have done some yeah, right. better there. So maybe in five years, there's going to be a, a better option. But yeah, for now, we decided, no, we, we want to okay. nuke our clothes with a good old fashioned clothes dryer. And, well, yeah. and, and these are some of the choices, right? Where, um, uh, I mean, with, with solar being inexpensive the way that it is, our desire to fill the whole roof for aesthetic reasons, we could have downgraded to a, a less intense panel, right? Um, we did 360 watt panels and we could have done the, the 240s, I guess. Well, that wouldn't have been enough, but um, yeah, you know, again, that's, that's one of those like owner preference items, mm -hmm. right? Where it just um, was, you know, what we decided to do. Also, we were buying appliances during the pandemic. So um, appliances in the pandemic, as everybody knows, has been a real challenge. <laughs> so, I didn't even get it. Luckily, we got our appliances literally three days before we closed on the house that we sold across the street. So we were, for several Same months, laundry. traipsing back. So luckily, we still had a, we still had laundry over there. But yeah. uh, Maybe another ex exciting product, and I think, Marina, I love what you said because all of us have that love for our gas range and we wanted the gas range, but now we want to decarbonize. We want to do what's right for the planet and, and our family's health. But can you talk about your journey to go from gas to induction and then maybe give us a little insight on your induction cooktop and what you've come to learn? Sure. So I was um, cooking on a friend's chambers at their vacation home for a number of years, and that's how I kind of got interested in them. So I absolutely loved my chambers. Then I started reading, I think that um, Berkeley National Lab started publishing some of their research about the health impacts of cooking with gas around about 2013. So that would be a year after we moved into our house and put in <laughs> the chambers. So I started using my exhaust fan more, but then I actually um, brought home an indoor air quality monitor from, and this was around the time that we were um, looking into adoption. And so, you know, thinking about air quality for having a baby in the house and all of that. Um, and I brought home a, an indoor air quality monitor and set it up in the kitchen and it would lose its mind whenever I was cooking, even with the range hood on. Um, and so that was, definitely part of my education as far as um, being a little bit more tuned into the, the health risks there, especially in a tight home. Um, one of the reasons I could so easily give up my fireplace, which was beautiful and, and wonderful, was because I was smelling it 
on the regular whenever we had a rainy day. Again, even with our balanced ventilation and all this stuff, and we barely ever used the thing either, but I was just, I have a very sensitive sense of smell. So that is my superpower. I can smell things. Um, so, uh, but I was suddenly like, oh my gosh, you know, like this is more of a big deal than I thought. And again, thinking about babies, you know, and the fact that they, um, they breathe so much faster. I mean, they take in so much more as a percentage of their body weight than we do, that they're that much more impacted by all of those potential pollutants. So I got freaked out about gas, basically. And that helps you be much more open-minded to alternatives. Um, and I've got to say, uh, I mean, cooking on induction is, it is fabulous. <laughs> Like I, have, I have nothing bad to say. It's amazing. Uh, it's, it's, if you it's, buy cheap pans, you will get a little bit of a, a hum. And I have some hum. Pans, That's right. And I get a little bit of a hum. But it is more than made up for by the fact that I don't have to run my range hood every time I'm baking something. Right. And I bake stuff all the time now. I use my oven so much more. And I don't know if it's partly just a psychological thing, but you know, when you have the something that gives you the choice of like, oh, you can microwave this or you can bake yeah. it. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, that has been a very easy adjustment. I mean, there's there's like a learning curve as with anything, right? Like figuring out where on the dial, not having the visual, because I was yeah, very much used fun. to looking at the flame, right? To yeah, see sure. where, I, where I wanted it, right? Um, so now having to, I, I became much more into like, you know, setting the timer <laughs> and kind of like cooking by numbers a little bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got nothing bad to say. I mean, my kid likes pasta and the fact that he can pitch a fit and insist on pasta and I can have that pot boiling in 60 seconds. Is that is the most incredible thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And just to throw a plug in, but we've done an induction cooked up uh, cooking series with a professional chef. And your colleague, Carla Butterfield, actually talked about some of the air quality issues around gas cooking. So please, um, if you want to learn more, tune in and, and view that. So, uh, well, I want, if, if you had to, you mentioned some of the lessons learned, some of the things you might do differently next time. You know, knowing the two of you, you'll probably do another house uh, someday. I don't know, maybe you're done now. But yes. We always say absolutely not, never again. Yeah, you'll, you'll do it. it. Years. Yeah, maybe. I'm the same way. I'm working on my house now, and I always said I'd never do it again. But um, give us some of those lessons learned, or maybe if, if there are folks out there that want to remodel, some advice that you'd give them. And Well, this has nothing to do with, well, it could have something to do with energy efficiency, but is, um, we were very budget conscious and our goal was to stay within basically what we thought the value of the home was at any given point. Um, and when you're focused on that, it can be very easy to make choices for a lower cost option that you can sometimes regret later. <laughs> so whether it has, I, the things I regret are, are often things that have either a usability component or a durability component. And I think I'll, I'll give an example of um, in the master bathroom, uh, there was a shower pan that was beautiful and had a really a taller lip on it. And it was like $600 more than the one that I wound up getting. And now when I get water on my wood floor, because I didn't want to put in tile because I was trying to keep my carbon down. Mm -hmm. um, I think, man, that would have been $600 well spent <laughs> to not be like paranoid and mopping up the floor every, every moment. So, uh, you know, trying to take a, a little bit of a long view, we still keeping an eye on a budget, but taking a, a long view. Um, I had a, a colleague who said, you regret the stuff you don't do. And I think that's, that's been true. I mean, that, that's true of our, the ventilation that we're now considering that we need more of. So I guess that would be another lesson learned. Whatever you're thinking about fresh air, double it. <laughs> right. Uh, I also love, I just wanted your advice on, you talked about that air quality sensor that you bought. Um, can you recommend something to homeowners that are out there? You know, I wish I could, but unfortunately I can't. That one was a Fubot. And um, I, I actually had uh, somebody at the office with one one, so we kind of passed it around. But I, I believe that they stopped supporting it. Something changed recently with Fubot. I don't know. I got an email about it. So 
Unfortunately, I, I don't have a recommendation, but that would be a great topic I, I would like to know. I think it can be, I mean, you have to take them with a, a, a grain of salt, right? Because sometimes they're using um, proxies, for example. They're not, might not measure everything specifically. They're using something else to stand in as a proxy for that other thing, and it might not always work out. The ones that we can afford, they're not um, maybe the most sensitive. But even for a short time, I mean, it, it changed my behavior, right? So um, having it in my kitchen for a short time and seeing that immediate change and seeing how long it stayed red for after I'd finished cooking, I mean, was was very effective. So um, I think it's a great a great strategy to use, you know, kind of understanding that they might not be perfect. Right. Steve, any final thoughts? <laughs> oh. uh, hmm. As far as the electrification goes, when I called the gas company to come and take the meter and all that stuff, they looked at me like, I'm sorry, why do you, you don't want this anymore? And I'm like, yeah, this line that goes from there to there, I don't need that either. And just kill it in the street. Um, I think that was a big one. People, their eyebrows, eyebrows go up, I think the most about that. I'm like, well, you don't have any gas or anything like that and you're okay with just all electricity. Um, and the, the whole point is that there's no way for you to um, get away from carbon if you're consuming energy that's um, either gas or produced by gas. So um, I would say it's not something I do differently. It's something that I am glad that we did intentionally was to um, to go all electric and, and engage professionals that can help you do that. Because as you, you know, as we refine buildings and houses and all this uh, and building science around them, um, the tolerances do also shrink. And, you know, the things that you do incorrectly um, are going to bite you more than they would have in the past, but you also have more you know, potential to achieve good things too. So yeah, engaging someone or people who know what they're talking about um, is I think a big takeaway. Luckily, we kind of are those people, but mostly we work with a lot of those people. So yeah. it was easy for us to-, to Well, that. I think it's great advice for others that don't work in the field is make sure you reach out to experts. Uh, you know, one of the things, like if you go to the directory of professionals with EBA and Team Zero, you're going to find Stephen Winters Associates. You're going to find some of the HVAC contractors, some of the builders, some of the subcontractors that are doing zero energy, zero carbon, zero health impact homes. So we're trying to curate those for people to make it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I love the advice about the energy rate or two. I mean, it is such a small amount to spend for somebody that is just dedicated to the sustainability of your home. Well, a lot of this stuff, I mean, is hard to redo. You know, we're not getting into these walls again, hopefully ever. You know, yeah. we're not re -insulating. We're not hopefully replacing these windows for a long time. Hopefully we're not replacing anything in this house for a long time. So if you're going to do it, do it right. That's right. And I'd even apply, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about repair and retrofit because I think Steve, you said it, my heating system goes down or my air conditioner goes down. The impulse is to just replace it with another cheap one. But at those inflection points, if if we as homeowners can be thinking about decarbonization and just take a little bit more time, run the analysis, and we'll share that for folks, I think, uh, Maureen, of how you thought about that. But do the analysis and maybe move to something that's less carbon heavy, carbon intensive. We're all going to change things and help drive market transformation. Yeah, not everybody can gut a house from top to bottom. So when you're given the opportunity to make it a decision, make a good one. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, Maureen and Steve, I want to thank you so much for inviting us all into your home today. It's been our pleasure. And we were so excited to be able to learn from uh, both of you and your experience. And you have a beautiful home. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Great. Let me, uh, we'll come back on video and we've got um, a couple questions for you guys. And uh, Steve, the most important question we have is that was a dog on his lap the whole time. What was your, what's your dog's name? <laughs> uh, his name is Charlie. He is a miniature schnoodle, which is uh, part schnoodle, part or part schnauzer, part poodle. 
Um, he sounds like a designer dog. He looks like a designer dog, but he's actually a mutt. So you never know what you're going to get. That's fantastic. Uh, one of the things, and I'm going to go through some of the questions because we were answering questions live uh, as you went through, but just for our whole audience. So one of the questions was, did you monitor indoor CO2 levels to support your decision to add more fresh air vent ventilation, or could you just tell from the way uh, that it feels? So I think that was a lesson learned in our last house, and it was by the way that it felt, um, where we started out with an exhaust only strategy. We found that it felt stuffy and we checked the humidity because that would be the first thing that you would want to do and found that that wasn't the issue. So um, we added the ERV to that home after a couple of years of living in it. Mm -hmm. And here, um, I think it's been uh, sort of a similar experience. We've had the ERV operating upstairs the whole time, but want to add more fresh air to the main levels. We weren't planning to be working from home for a year either and be in the space all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, when I shut my door, I don't have fresh air in this room. So that was, you know, of course that wasn't the intent when I designed this room, I thought it was a playroom. So I wasn't gonna shut the door. Um, but yeah, that's been more from the experience of living in it. We did have a FUBOT indoor air quality monitor yeah. um, in, the, in the last house for a while, but the main thing we learned from that was more so about uh, cooking with gas and using the fireplace, yeah. which is why we were comfortable getting rid of all combustion in this house. Yeah, and I believe that Panasonic system you have, that has some smart tech in it where it's monitoring indoor, is it monitoring indoor air quality and turning the fans on automatically? Is that the Panasonic Cosmos that you were using? We don't Not ours right now, no. Okay. But we are aware of that technology and, and yeah. considered using it, but just went with a more straightforward approach. Yeah, so just a quick answer. You know, you go on the EBA Academy. It's a great, um, there's some great sessions on the Cosmos system, which has some smarts. And there's some great um, lessons on sensor systems. Uh, I know Air Things, or we talked about FUBOT, but really comparing the different sensor systems and that's something um, to take a look at. Maureen, I think you answered on the overall cost for the renovation. Do you want to just reiterate that for everyone? Sure. The renovation itself came out to about $140 per square foot. And the overall project cost was um, about $230. Is that what I? Yeah, that's what you. That's yeah, what you. Um, including the, the purchase price of the home as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I know we're coming up. Uh, against having to be at some other meetings, but is there just, you know, in watching that again and, and what a, you know, what a great conversation. Is there anything that you guys want to add to that um, original conversation that we had? Any other lessons learned or? Uh... You know, there was a, a question about, you know, passive house and, and considering the standards and what you want. Um, I guess the, the lesson learned is that when it is your own home, even though you work on this stuff every day, it becomes very personal decisions. And we talked about that a little bit in the video, but um, you start to think about, you know, like, is my dog going to be able to see out these windows? And that becomes a design consideration of equal weight and importance to you, maybe, as, you know, some of the things about energy and sustainability. So um, I certainly don't you know fault anyone for choosing a slightly different path or a slightly different set of goals that that meets your objectives i think in this case you know we took advantage of our roof um we're net positive and very happy to be happy to be there um so we didn't you know go as far maybe on the overall energy savings as we otherwise could have but it, it came out to the best result for us in our in our budget yeah for this project so you have a negative HERS score then, right? That's incredible. And you're going to certify to Zero Energy Ready Home from Department of Energy. And you're going to certify to the new LEED, is it LEED net positive? So we're doing um, LEED V4.1, LEED for Homes version 4.1, and then we'll do the innovation credit for LEED Zero. That's right, so innovation credit for LEED Zero. So again, all incredible programs, you know, at EBA, we don't, we're kind of like you, we don't judge programs, but, but pick some, pick the ones that work for you. We love Passive House. We love Living Building Challenge. We love LEAD. We love uh, the ResNet, HER score. But um, I think that 
having professionals come alongside you is really going to help you uh, achieve those goals. Well, I just want to thank you both again on behalf of the audience. It's such an inspirational and incredible presentation. I think the biggest thing that blew me away is, Steve, what you said, which is, you don't want this gas meter anymore? <laughs> like, well, because where we live, some people can't have gas because of the, yeah. you know, the rocks and the ledge and they yeah. just, their choices are all electric or oil or yeah. propane. And, um, you know, uh, so they're still begging to get gas and here we are cutting it. So not that we have anything technically against, you know, that, but this is the direction we've chosen to do. It's just, we sort of leapfrogged it, right? We, yeah. You had your oil and that was your only choice um, or propane. Um, right. You can leapfrog over natural gas if you really wanted to by going all electric. And I think that's what um, is surprising to some people. It's really surprising. And I think that we're seeing codes change across the United States and Canada too, right? So there are requirements now to, you know, some of our builders, uh, some people remodeling will need to go to all electric. Although I would say most of them are in climate zones that are much more forgiving than uh, than you have in Connecticut or definitely than I have in Minneapolis. But uh, California is heading there. I think Fort Collins and Boulder are heading there. And there are others that are heading that direction. So, well, great. Well, I wanna thank you again. It, it's always a pleasure to see both of you and uh, absolutely fantastic house and a great inspiration for us all. Thanks a lot, Aaron. All right, have a great Thanks rest of the day. All right, bye now.